Amen. Amen. Nothing is better than you, God. Ah, so good. It is good to be together uh, as a church, even though obviously things are a little bit different for us uh, this morning and, and uh, has been for the last couple weeks and will be uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, I want to just say thank you to our church family. Uh, we have had lots of encouraging texts, uh, emails, phone calls, uh, uh, just about people, about you as a congregation, as a church, uh, joining us via live stream. And uh, last week, we, uh, we received a number of pictures uh, of your families as you sat around your TV in your living room or in your basement or in your man caves and uh, enjoyed the service from there. And so uh, it's so good. Uh, even right now, I'm getting some texts. I, I get texts on my, on my uh, watch, and so I'm even hearing some snide comments from some of you out there. Uh, so it's good. It feels like you're almost here in person. Um, so we thank you as well for your grace. Uh, we thank you for uh, your, your patience as we kind of figure this thing out. Uh, as it's new for you, it's new for us also. Um, it is weird. It's awkward. It's everything else. As I sit in, in an empty um, room like this and preach, uh, it's a little bit different because I'm not getting the reaction as much from the congregation and, and being able to read uh, body language and be able to read the expressions on the face. Uh, it's amazing how much uh, preaching is very interactive. And of course, when the, uh, the seats aren't filled up, uh, it makes it a little bit different. Uh, as you know, uh, the last couple of weeks have been, um, uh, lots has gone on, lots has changed. Uh, from three weeks ago when, when the uh, church council was sitting together and wondering, okay, should we cancel service on Sunday or what? And, and at that point it looked, well, you know, should we, should we not? And, and we just went back and forth on that a few times and, and just a number of things that have happened since then uh, that uh, this is a different normal for us right now. Um, Lots has changed, but what I want to do this morning, uh, I'd like to speak into the life of our church, uh, and, and by church, I don't mean this building. Uh, if you've been with us for any period of time, you know that we communicate the church is uh, people. Uh, it's not a building. Church is the people, and uh, even though you know, we meet in a building and we refer to this as the church building, uh, you, the people, followers of Jesus Christ, you are the church. And so I want to speak to us this morning. I know that there are people uh, joining us via the live stream uh, at various places in your journey, in your walk uh, with God. Some of you maybe are, are, are skeptical. You're just checking out who God is. Um, and, and then there's the others that are just sold out and, and, and you're following after God and you're desiring to be obedient to Him. Uh, wherever you are in your journey, we just want to welcome you here and we're glad that you're tuning in uh, this morning. Um, as, as followers of Jesus Christ, uh, you know that uh, we have a different filter that we use that forms our decisions, or at least uh, that's beginning to transform in our lives, where the filter that we use to evaluate things in our life are different from the world's filter. Um, and the Bible speaks to this. Paul speaks to this in Romans chapter 12, where he says um, that we should not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Um, and, and, and some of you have asked me in the past, uh, I like to use different translations when I preach. I like to use different translations when I read my Bible, when I do my devotions in the morning. Uh, and, and the reason why I like to use different translations uh, is because when the original manuscripts were, were written, they were written in Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, and in the scriptures there was about 11,260 words in those languages. But when we translated into our English versions, uh, the English Bible only uses about 600 words. Okay, so you can see that uh, the English translation only uses a little more than half of the amount of words that the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic translations used. And so because of that, what that means is that there are certain nuances, there are uh, certain uh, shades of meaning uh, that we miss when we just use one translation. 
And so sometimes when I read another translation, it helps me to better understand what the original authors were trying to communicate to their audience. Um, perhaps you've heard somebody tell a joke in another language. And uh, you, of course, because you don't speak that language, you ask, okay, what's, uh, what was that joke all about? What was so funny? And the person sometimes responds, well, if I translate it into English, it, d- it just doesn't make sense. Uh, you, you won't get it, because there's not really a, an equal translation from my language into English. Um, and so that's kind of what's happening here when we have the translations from the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, uh, and then into our English translation. And so that's why I like to use different translations, all right? Sometimes using a different translation than what I'm used to using, it allows me to understand the, the context. It, it helps me to understand the text a little bit better. And so that passage, uh, that verse, Romans chapter two, uh, 12, verse 2 in the New Living Translation reads like this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Isn't that good, right? Followers of Jesus, we are not of this world. We are not to copy, we're not to imitate the patterns, the behaviors, the customs of this world. And what happens so often when we have crisis like we have now with the the COVID-19 virus and, and, and the crisis that we are living in right now, what tends to happen in our society is that there tends to be a lot of fear and a lot of panic that kind of overtakes us. But Scripture tells us, as Christ followers, we're not to live in fear. As followers, we don't want to live in fear, but we are instead to be people of faith, okay? To be transformed in the renewing and and, and the change in how we think. Uh, A couple weeks ago, I spoke to our church congregation from Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. And in there, we, we learned that the people were experiencing a frightening task before them, And Haggai the prophet, um, the Lord spoke to Haggai and through Haggai to the people. And he said to the people, as you go about your frightening task, he says, number one, be strong, do the work, and do not fear. And the bottom line of all that is they can be strong and they can do the work and they don't have to fear was because God was with them, that God promised to be with them. And I would say this to us as followers of Jesus Christ. That in the midst of lots of fear, in in the midst of lots that is going on that we are not aware of, lots of unknown things going on right now, there's lots of fear, there's lots of panic in regards to this virus, that you as a Christ follower, me as a Christ follower, we are actually carrying something that is far more powerful than COVID-19. I want to turn that around for us a little bit this morning and give you something to think about as a Christ follower, that you, Christ follower, are infected already. That Christ follower, you are already contagious. Uh, Christ follower, you are already a carrier of something far greater than COVID-19, and that is that you are infected and you are contagious because you have the Holy Spirit living in you. Far more powerful than COVID-19. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. And we as Christ followers are actually called to be infectious. We are called to be contagious. We are called to be carriers of hope in this time. All right? Be contagious. We're carriers of something far more powerful. What I want to do in the few minutes that we have together this morning is to show you three ways from Scripture, three ways that we can be carriers of hope in our community, three ways that we can be carriers of hope in our world today. Because if ever there was a time where the world is listening and the world is looking to see where do I find answers, we have an opportunity as Christ followers to speak powerfully into our situation here. The first thing, if you're taking notes this morning, is that we can be carriers of hope and we are carriers of hope when we live in faith and not in fear. As Jesus was preparing his disciples uh, for his departure, 
Um, they were fearful. They were wondering, okay, what's going to happen now? What, how is this all going to work out, Jesus? When you leave us and you go, um, what are we going to do without you here? And so there was lots of fear that was creeping in with his disciples and with his followers. And Jesus said these words to his disciples in John chapter 14. Words that we often use at a funeral. But Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Okay. He went on to say later on in this chapter, verse 27. He says, I am leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Uh, later on in chapter 16 of the same book, John chapter 16, verse 7, uh, Jesus tells his disciples, it's actually better if I go, because when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, I'm going to send the advocate, the Holy Spirit, and he is going to come and he is going to be with you. I wonder if there are some here uh, that are listening this morning who are living in fear, uh, that there is lots of anxiety in your life. You're afraid of what's going to go on. You're afraid of what's going to happen with our economy. You're afraid of what's going to happen with our world. Um, but because as Christ followers, we don't have to live in fear. We can live in faith. Jesus said to his disciples, and he says to you as well, I'm leaving you with a gift. Okay? The thing about a gift is we don't work for a gift. Uh, we don't earn the gift. Okay? Jesus said, I'm going to give you the gift of peace. I'm, I'm going to give it to you. When we receive a gift, when someone is offering us a gift, what do we do with that gift? We receive it. Okay? We accept it. We get excited about it. And I want to say that there are probably some listening this morning that haven't received that gift of the Holy Spirit, that haven't received the gift that Jesus is offering to you. And I want to give you an opportunity later on when, when I'm kind of finishing up to give you an opportunity to receive that gift because Jesus is extending that to you today as well. And what we do when we are given a gift is we accept that gift and we say, yes, wow, I can't believe you're giving me a gift, but I thank you for this. God wants to give us peace of mind and heart. While the rest of the world wants to live in fear, we want to open up that gift that God has given to us. Peace of mind, peace of heart. We want to accept the gift of His holy, holy presence, the gift of His Holy Spirit that gives us not only eternal life, but also brings purpose and meaning to our life here in this world. A peace that is nothing that the world can offer us. It's a peace that only can come from heaven, that can only come through a heavenly Father. And Jesus says, the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Okay? Why? Because we serve a God who, like Haggai, reminded the people of his day. We serve a God who is with us. A God who is always faithful. A God who is always in control. A God who is always good. A God who has a plan. A God who will never leave us or fail us. A God who will never forsake, forsake us. He will never abandon us. But God is working in all situations. Even though all situations aren't good, He is working in those situations to bring about something good in our life. And so Christ followers, Jesus followers, we are carriers of hope into each other's lives. We are carriers of hope into our neighbor's lives. We are carriers of hope into our world. And if there has ever been a time for us to be carriers and for us to have open doors to speak into our neighbor's lives, it is now. 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verses 8 to 11, and I'll reference this a little bit later on. But it says this, that while we are pressed on every side by trials, while we're per perplexed, while we're hunted down, while we're knocked down, we are never abandoned by God. Okay. Followers of Jesus Christ, we can live by peace and not by panic. 
We can live by faith and not by fear because God is present in our lives, because God is present in our situation, because God is present in our circumstances. And we can be carriers of hope when we live by faith and not by fear. And when we live as people of faith, we are infectious. We are contagious to those people around us. Here's the second way that we can be uh, uh, carriers of hope. We can be carriers of hope when we live selfless lives. Okay? We can be carriers of hope when we live selfless lives. Because by nature, we are selfish people. Right? We are all born with a selfish nature. I don't know if you've ever uh, watched a young a, a baby Okay, babies are, we are born into this world with a selfish nature. Babies, they cry when they're hungry, they cry when they're tired, they cry when they need their diapers changed, they cry when they're uncomfortable, and they expect to have somebody deal with their uncomfortableness. They expect somebody to deal with their issues, they expect somebody to give them what they want when they want, which is right now, and they will, will not stop crying until their needs are met. Nobody taught babies to be selfish. Nobody taught us to be selfish. That was just part of our nature. By, by nature, babies don't think about other people. By nature, babies just think about themselves. They put their needs ahead of everybody else. That's who we are by nature. We're selfish people by nature. But Paul said we need to be transformed Okay, by the renewing of our minds, from being selfish people to be selfless people, right? Paul said to the church in Philippi, and, and, and read these words in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. He says to the church, don't be selfish, okay? Be transformed here. Don't be selfish, that's your old nature. Don't try to impress others, that's your old nature. Instead, he says, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves, don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Why? Why do we take on that nature? Why do we transform our thinking from selfishness to selflessness? Because Paul says, Christ follower, following after Christ means you imitate and you have the same attitude that he had. What was his attitude? Paul went on to say this. In speaking about Jesus Christ, he says this. Though he was God. Okay? It doesn't say, though he was a God. He was God. Okay? He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. You see, our new nature as Christ followers is not selfish, but it's his nature. It's his selfless and his sacrificial love that now becomes a part of who we are and we are transformed from selfishness to selflessness and we learn to imitate Christ in becoming more and more selfless less okay christ lives in us and so as christ followers we are not to be selfish we don't just live for our own interests but we look out for the interests of others hmm. when paul was writing to the early church uh, the early church was facing incredible uh, persecution Many of them had lost their homes and many of them had lost their families. Oftentimes it would mean that they would, uh, in fact, lose their lives for following after their faith in Jesus. And I think we too, church, have an incredible opportunity again to love and to serve other people in the name of Jesus Christ. We see what happened in the early church in Acts chapter 2, verse 44. It says this, that all the believers were together and they had everything in common. Now watch what they did here, okay? They didn't hoard, okay? They weren't rushing to Costco to buy up all the toilet paper for themselves, but instead, verse 45 says this, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. See that? What I wonder about church, I wonder if in the next few weeks or months, 
we will have more opportunities for generosity in the name of Jesus than we have ever seen before because our eyes are being opened to this. In fact, I pray that my eyes would be open. I pray that our eyes as a church would be more and more opened that as we see a need, we would step out and we would meet that need. That we would recognize where God has blessed us in our life and we would use that blessing to bless other people that we come in contact with. And this might be material, but it might be more than material. It might be spiritually as well. And by faith, we are going to be carriers of hope we are going to speak words of peace in the time of fear and panic. We are going to speak words and be companions to those in the midst of their isolation. Even though how we minister to people, how we become a companion in these times is different than what we've experienced before. But maybe we take up being on FaceTime a little bit more often. Maybe we get in and we're texting and we're phoning people. Uh, maybe we're dropping off food at people's doors. Uh, you know, I, I've heard different things like that, even with our life groups in our church, that even though they can't meet together in a room, I've heard of life group members going to another life group uh, member's place and, uh, and just sitting on the patio and talking on the phone, even though they're looking through the windows of the patio doors. I mean, how cool is that, that they're sharing life together, and they're looking for creative ways to be together, even though they're keeping their social distance and adhering to the government standards and the government advice and, and, uh, and wisdom that they have. Look what it says, verse 46, Acts chapter 2, verse 46. It says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, okay? That was their public meeting together. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together and were glad and sincere in heart, okay? Every day, every day they got together. I mean, it's not just a one hour a, a week Sunday service, but they got together daily, Right? They had everyday faith, daily faith, daily walks with God, daily walks where they would meet with other believers and they would share what God was doing in their life and they would encourage one another and they just kept on going in their faith. Let me just pause here for a minute because I like those words at the end of verse 46, they broke bread in their homes. Okay? That's our, our Lord's Supper, that's our communion service. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Um, next week, Good Friday, uh, April 10th, we're going to continue with our service at 10 a.m. However, because of the situation and the times that we're in, we're going to still live stream that service and you're going to meet in your homes together with your families. But we are going to practice communion that day. We're going to observe communion because that's what we do on Good Friday services. And so I want to give you a little bit of a heads up on this, that you in your home will prepare some bread or you'll prepare crackers or maybe it's cookies or however you want to celebrate the breaking of bread together. And then you're going to get some juice together and, and, and order or, or organize the juice in your home. And we're going to lead you in a communion service so that you can participate in communion with your family in the living room or in the basement of your house. Okay, so just giving you a heads up on that. I'm looking forward to that and how we're going to do communion a little different this year. But let me read that verse now from the New Living Translation, verse 46 again. It says, They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Okay, now look what happened. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Okay, I believe in this time, that God will use this time, God is using this circumstance and this situation. Even though he didn't cause this, I believe he wants to use this situation when people are afraid that people will turn their eyes to him, that they will look to him, and we will see daily people coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior throughout our world. Right? I'm curious what God is going to do in this time. Uh, we've been forced out of our comfort zones, and we've been taking things online like this more than we used to, and, and this is not a bad thing. This is a, a good thing. 
Uh, now, honestly, I was a little bit resistant, uh, resistant to this. I was thinking, okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do this, you know, in a year from now, or maybe it's five years down, from, down, uh, down the road from now. Um, but it's kind of been forcing us to change immediately. And what I'm learning through this experience is that the internet, our live streaming, our presence on Facebook, our technology awareness is becoming a front door to our church. Okay? The technology is becoming a front door. That people, if you've ever, if you can remember back to when you were first coming to church, it's awkward, it's uncomfortable coming through the front doors of a church. But now through this crisis, and we've been forced to get online more, it is allowing people to come in through technology to come see what church is all about. They can check us out in the comfort of their own home, and that's a good thing. I'm so thankful now for the technology that we can do this kind of thing. And so if you're new to SEMC, I want to welcome you here through our live stream. And I pray and I hope that maybe there will be time in the not too distant future where you will come through the doors and we will be able to meet face to face. Church, we are carriers of hope when we live selfless lives. Because selfless living is contagious because selfless living is infectious there's a third thing i see in scripture and that is that we can be carriers of hope as we let our life and we let our light shine okay. we've been saying this in a variety of different ways in the midst of this outbreak that this is a time when we as a church need to be leaning in Okay, we're leaning in, we're doing things a little bit different maybe than what we're used to, but we're not going to sit back, we're not going to ret retreat in a time like this, but rather it's an opportunity for us as a church to let our light and our life shine. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5 verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl, instead they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, and here's the application for us, it says this. Here's our homework. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In a time when there is lots of fear and panic and there's lots of selfishness, my prayer is that we as a church would become more faith-filled, that we would be more peace-filled, that we would become more selfless and more creative in how we shine the love of Jesus to the people in our lives, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. And I am praying that we as a church would become more infectious, that we'd become more contagious with Christ's love than ever before. Because as the world grows darker, Christ's light shines brighter because we are called to be agents of reconciliation paul said this in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 18 that god has brought us back to himself through christ and god has given us this task here's our assignment again right he has given us this task church of reconciling people to himself are we in a battle you bet right? are times difficult you bet is there lots of opposition? Yeah, absolutely there is. But our battle is not against people. It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers and authorities and power of this dark world. We, as Christ followers, are not of this world. Therefore, Christ followers, we will live by faith and not fear. We will live by peace and not panic. We will be selfless. We will be sacrificial in our giving. We will be sacrificial in our generosity, and we will let the light of Jesus that shines in us shine through us, and we will not hide it. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 9 says this, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This great treasure is Jesus Christ living in us, the Holy Spirit living in us. It is our salvation that is, uh, that is that great treasure in us. And this makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from us. 
We are pressed on every side by the troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed because of who Jesus is, because of what Jesus has done, because of his great power, because of his grace in our lives. And no matter what comes, because of Christ, we live in faith, we live selfless lives, and we will let our light shine bright. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today I pray that you would build our faith. We would build, you would build the faith of our church, that we would uh, let our light shine to our world. Heavenly Father, for those who are hurting, for those who are sick, we pray for healing in their lives. We pray for protection upon us. We pray for wisdom, Heavenly Father. We pray for a vaccine. Father, we pray for our leaders who have to make incredibly tough decisions. And Father, we pray for our church that when the world grows darker, that our light would shine brighter. I pray, Heavenly Father, that every day, that we would be every day uh, people of faith, that we would see, see opportunities that come our way to show our love generously, that we would show our love extravagantly, that we would give words of encouragement and support and comfort. I pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are experiencing a lot of uh, fear right now. Uh, as times are unsettling, as darkness does tend to loom, Heavenly Father, uh, as people are looking for answers, I pray, Father, that hope would be spoken to their lives. I want to speak to those of you, as I said earlier, uh, those of you who are looking for answers, those who are looking for hope, let me tell you about the best news you could ever hear, that there is a longing inside each one of us for something more, something different, something that we cannot find in this world. And while I don't know your particular story, whatever it is that you're trying to find happiness in or fulfillment in this life, it cannot deliver. Because those things were not meant to fill the ultimate void that is in each one of us. And that void in our life can only be filled by Jesus Christ. The good news is that we have a God that is bigger than this world. And, that, and yet, in the midst of that, how he loves this world and he's bigger than this world, he loves us so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, uh, he showed his love for us when he came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the sinless son of God, perfect in every way who gave his life on a cross for all of our sins, your sins, my sins, and God raised him from the dead so that anyone, and that includes you, okay, that anyone and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ can be saved. Today, as you watch from wherever you are this morning, those of you who would recognize, I don't have that peace. I don't have that assurance. Uh, scripture again is clear that when we call on the name of Jesus, when we turn for, from our sins and we turn to him, that he hears our prayer and he will forgive us of our sins. And he doesn't just save us from eternal damnation, which he does, but he also saves us from a life of meaninglessness and gives us purpose and meaning in this life here on this earth. Today, if you're watching this and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but you're saying, yes, I want that. I want that peace. I want that forgiveness. I want God's grace in my life. I want to lead you this morning in a simple prayer. And it's not about saying the right words, right? God knows your heart. If you want that, if you want relationship with him, he's offering that as a gift to you this morning. And I want to pray with you together. Heavenly Father, I ask for the forgiveness of my sins. Jesus, save me and make me new. Fill me with your spirit so that I can serve you, so that I can follow you, the rest of my life. I give my life to you. I thank you for new life. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer this morning, if you've prayed that prayer for the first time, I would so encourage you to send me an email, send their church office an email just to let us know that, that you prayed that prayer to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, and then I'd love to follow up with you on that uh, to help you get started in your new life in Christ. Uh, know that I'm praying for you, I love you, and hope to see you someday soon face to face. Thank you.